Please. Good morning, brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers in the faith. Thank you uh, so much for having me back. It is such a joy. I didn't get to say it to you all last week, uh, but it's such a joy to be back worshiping with you all. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Christian Ryan. I am uh, your resident seminarian, as it were, uh, away at school at Mid-America Reform Seminary, and I'm so happy to be back here uh, as your intern the summer. So you'll be seeing more of me, not only in the preaching, but hopefully in uh, visitation as well, and uh, catching up with most of you, hopefully all of you, throughout this summer. Uh, open with me first to Mark's Gospel. We'll be continuing going through the sermon or the sermon series that Bob has been working through. Mark chapter 9. Our text today will be verses 30 through 37, and that's just what I'll read here. Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37, page 845, I believe, in the Pew Bible. Starting at verse 30. They, that is, the disciples and Jesus, went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he, Jesus, did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and he went in, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing along the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all, and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name, receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This is the word of the Lord that remains forever. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, may your spirit go out in the preaching of your word, not only through my lips, but through these ears and hearts that listen. Convict us of our sin, bring us to faith in Christ. Amen. I am very glad to be picking up here where Bob has been preaching through Mark's gospel. I've been listening from afar on Sermon Audio uh, to a fair bit of his sermons, not all of them, uh, but able to get the gist of where he's been and hopefully to place this sermon well within his series. We will look at uh, some of the great things in this text that this passage speaks to. The depths of sin and its consequences in the death of Christ, the sometimes wearisome service of a Christian made to shine like the golden offering to God that it is, and the heights of God's love for wretched sinners such as us. These are truly amazing things to think about on this Lord's Day morning. And I'll deal with this passage simply by working through it from the first to the last. So I ask you that you keep your Bibles open and work through it with me. First, in verses 30 through 31, we will work through Christ's determination to accomplish his mission. Next, we will see the disciples' blindness and pride when confronted with Jesus' determination. Third, we will examine how Christ models and demands a perfect servant leadership and what that really means for us as Christians today. And lastly, we will look at receiving our reward for such service. So Christ's determination, the disciples' blindness and pride, Christ's servant leadership, and our Christian reward. First then, Christ's determination. Here at the end of chapter 9, uh, we were past the per turning point, as it were, geographically, of Jesus' ministry. From here on out in Mark's gospel, Jesus is going down from the north country, from the Mount of Transfiguration, through 
Galilee to Jerusalem, to Mount Calvary and the cross. And in our passage, Jesus and his disciples are still in Galilee, working their way down. And they'll go down to Capernaum, the city on the Sea of Galilee, and continue on to Jerusalem. And you could say then that Christ's passion narrative has already begun. Jesus has, as Isaiah said that he would, set his face like flint to go down to Jerusalem. And this determination to get to Jerusalem is why it says here that he, Jesus, did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples. He has done all the public work that he would do in Galilee. From here on, as Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem, Mark records no large-scale miracles. Jesus doesn't go out of his way to do uh, public teaching. People meet him along the way, and he heals people along the way. But he has set his path to go to Jerusalem. And he's determined to get there. But as he's going, he's still teaching the disciples. And what is he teaching them? Simply the gospel, as we would put it today. Jesus says in verse 31, The Son of Man is to be delivered up into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. And as he is physically determined to get to Jerusalem to do this, so it is the center of what he is teaching as well. He is making it clear to his disciples that his own being delivered up and killed and rising from the dead is the most important thing to him. It would be good to mark some of the language here as well in this prophecy that Jesus makes about his own death and resurrection. He says that the Son of Man will be lifted up. It is a certain thing. It will happen. There is nothing which will prevent Jesus from going to that cross. Jesus was certain that it will happen, and we can be certain as well that it has happened. And as Christians, we can rest in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ. Likewise, Jesus says here that he will be delivered up. That is, that an outside force will give him into the hands of sinful men that they might kill him. That force is God's eternal purpose and predestination in Jesus' death and resurrection. He is on the long road to Calvary because it is the purpose that he came to earth to do in the first place. And he is determined to fulfill that will of the Father. Now, some translations have here that Jesus will be betrayed, but that puts the work, the effort, in man's hands. And a lot of people might draw the conclusion then that it's talking about Judas and his betrayal or some of the disciples that deceitfully convicted Jesus. But no, that's not what this is talking about. In this case, it is God's will and Jesus as God to be delivered up into the hands of men precisely because they will kill him and he will rise after three days. Brothers, sisters, Jesus came to earth and conducted his whole ministry, everything that's recorded in all the Gospels, with a purpose. And that purpose was to live a perfect life. Life to die a sinner's death on the cross for his very sinful people and to rise again on that third day, defeating death and hell and sin. And he promised that the new resurrected life that he won by that sacrifice would belong to any who repent of their sins and believe that he is the promised Son of God. Will you take Jesus at his own words? If you have not before, why do you not believe him now? Repent and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and your sins will be forgiven freely and fully. This is what, this was rather, the most important thing that Jesus needed to repeat to his disciples as he was going to his own death. If it was the most important thing to Jesus then, is it the most important thing to you now, today, as an individual? If it is, pick up your cross and follow Him. There are many things that can distract us in this Christian life, even good things. But we must never forget this main thing. 
The facts of the gospel come first, and from it flows new life in Christ. It doesn't work the other way around. We cannot act like better people in order to come to God. Jesus Jesus did not teach the disciples here simply how to be better people, or to have better morals, or to live their best life now as he's going down to Jerusalem. No, he taught them first that the Son of Man was to be killed and then rise on the third day. And this is the message that he would have us to know now. J.C. Ryle, who is a Reformed Anglican Bishop of Liverpool, said that he, Jesus, would have us know that his death was the great end for which he came into the world. He would remind us that by that death, the great problem was solved of how God could be just and yet declare sinners to be righteous. He came to pay the ransom for sin by his own blood and suffering on the cross. Let us never forget this. The incarnation, the example, and the words of Jesus are all very important. But the grand object, the biggest thing, which demands our notice in the story of his earthly ministry, is his death on the cross. Other things may be good in the Christian life, but none so great as the cross. It is the cross that Jesus bore and the death that he suffered that freed men and women like us from our sin. Let us never forget that that cross came before the crown that Jesus now wears as he reigns and rules in glory. And that crown in the nature of Christ's ruling as the crucified and the risen Lord is what the disciples could not and did not understand. And so we move then to consider the disciples' blindness and pride in verses 32 through 34. The disciples fundamentally did not understand that the rule, the reign of the coming Messiah, was to be gained through the means of death on a cross. They may have understood, as Peter confessed earlier in chapter 8, that Jesus is the Messiah, right? But they fundamentally misunderstood what that Messiah was to do. They, like the Jewish nation, were expecting a political savior, A political leader who would save them from Roman rule and reestablish an independent Jewish state. But rather, Jesus is saying that he, as Messiah, must die and save men from a far more persistent enemy, their own sin. This misunderstanding on the disciples' part is really a continuation of the partial blindness that Bob talked about Uh, when he preached on the blind man healed at Bethsaida. That man saw people, but, but not clearly. He thought they looked like walking trees, right? So Jesus shows here that the disciples are not seeing clearly. And as the text says, they did not understand. And indeed, they were even afraid to ask Jesus about this prophecy because it called into question their preconceived notions of what the Messiah was to be. They thought this because they were not setting their minds on the things of God, but on the things of men. The report gets worse, however, as we read on. When they do get where they are going for the day and stop at that house in Capernaum, it is revealed that along the way they had argued with one another about which one of them was the greatest. And really, this should strike us as sheer arrogance on the disciples' part. After Jesus had just made the statement that he did, that he was about to go and suffer and die, had they not just heard what Jesus said about his own coming dishonorable death? But then, no, they immediately go back to their darkened worldly ways of thinking and debating each other which one of them was the greatest, or presumably which would be the greatest in this new political system that they thought Jesus might be bringing in, ringing in. But how Jesus responds to this arrogant and really kind of silly question is very telling. He simply asks, what were you discussing along the way? Jesus knew what they were discussing, of course. He's God. Yet Jesus chose to ask them to put the ball in their court. And what's the response that they give? Nothing. They kept silent. 
they already know what they were doing was wrong. They, are, they were debating which one of them is the greatest when the one that they should be focusing on is walking down the road to Jerusalem right in front of them. One commentator uh, compares the disciples, these grown men, to a bunch of guilty schoolboys when a teacher has caught them playing games in the middle of class. And like a bunch of guilty schoolboys, the disciples f- sit there fidgeting amongst themselves and having nothing at all to say for themselves. Now, what is Jesus doing here? Well, he's prompting the disciples. He's trying to get them to say something, but really to take ownership over their own sin. They already know this is wrong, but they can't even bring themselves to say it. Jesus' method of correction, of discipline, is simply calling it out. What were you discussing along the way? He lets their own consciences convict them. And we can take good instruction from this. We often read the Gospels and we think, how stupid the disciples must be by now not to understand Jesus. He said to them time and time again, just a week before this, Jesus had made a, a similar prophecy about his death and resurrection, and they still don't understand because they cannot see that their own pride stands in the way. They will not admit to doing anything wrong, but instead they stand silent. Pride blinds them to the Lord's correction and teaching. And likewise, for us maybe, we think that others should hear this or that sermon. Others should hear this gospel. But what about you as an individual? Jesus knows what you think. He knows your true motivations for all you do in life. He knows that what we are trying to hide from him in our secret moments are secretly thinking that we are the greatest, even as the disciples argued here which of them was the greatest. But brother, sister, there is nothing hidden that will not be made manifest or anything secret that will not be known and come to light. This is true of your inner sins, most of all. The ones that convince us that we're better people than we are, that fool us that we can stand in our own righteousness. Jesus calls us simply to be honest as we follow him. He calls us to confession. He calls us to matching our public selves or who we would like to think that we are to who we really are when no one else is looking. The disciples felt ashamed because they knew that they were wrong, and so they are silent. Are you ashamed of your sin? Are you ashamed of your own pride? Of all the sins that you're trying to hide? Run to Christ for relief. He's the only one who is righteous and good. Remember what Paul said to the Philippians. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but to the interests of others. This is the way of discipleship, of following Jesus. And it brings us to our third point. Christ, our servant leader. Read verse 35 again with me. And he, Jesus, sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Jesus sits down. That is, he assumes the teaching position of formal instruction as rabbis would have at that time. And he calls the disciples and he says, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Now this is a radical notion of how someone is to be counted as first. Notice Jesus doesn't say that it's bad in itself to be first, but he redefines what being first means. If you would be first, Jesus says, if you want to be the best Christian, the best worker for Christ's kingdom, which is all what we are rightly called to do, it's not a bad thing. If you would be first, be last of all and servant of all. How radically opposite this is from this world. 
right? What do we see in this world of people wanting to be first? Right? We see and people constantly talk about uh, the famous, the rich, the prominent, the, the politicians, right? People are considered best because they shout the loudest, not because they have the best arguments. There's plenty to critique in the world. But let's not think that it's just all out there either. What does it mean to be last of men in a Christian context? Uh, one commentator gave the illustration of a Reformed Christian Bible conference. Uh, many of you would know G3 or Ligonier Ministry Conference or something like that. Now, there's nothing wrong with these conferences, and usually the topics discussed and the speakers present are all driving us to a greater holiness, to knowing our Lord better, to knowing our Bibles better. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you've ever been to this sort of thing or any kind of rally, really, what do people try to do when they're there? They spend their time trying to get close with those who are prominent, who are first in that context. Say, Ligon Duncan or R.C. Sproul or Paul Washer or Donald Trump, if you're at a Donald Trump rally, right? If they, they think that if they just have an interaction with this person, with this great man, that they will be greater for it, even if that's not what they're thinking in their head, they're hoping to gain some sort of greatness just by associating with this person. But Jesus calls us not to go to the great men first, but to the quiet man sheltered over in the corner who no one knows and who seems kind of out of place to care for the vendors and the cleaning staff who everyone else ignores, to think of ourselves as least of all in importance is to be first in God's eyes. Or even in this church. Now this is, and we can thank God for it, a small enough church where everyone can get to know each other and know the leadership. We can all know Bob and the elders and each other quite well. And that's a good thing. But we must be careful not to put our attention on the leaders of the church and spend time with them just to somehow, what, get their greatness or to think that we're better or make ourselves look more important than we are because, what, we're good friends with Bob? I, I, I kind of hope we all are by now to some extent. I'm not saying that any of the leadership in the church is better than us, but do we count ourselves as last of all in importance? If the disciples are just with Jesus because they want to be greatest by association, to be close to the big man in this coming political kingdom that they're thinking about, they have completely misunderstood Jesus' message. Jesus says to be last of all, really to be humble. To be humble. In Philippians 2, uh, which I quoted already above and which implored us to humbly think of others as more important than ourselves, it continues with this reasoning. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We are called to compare ourselves with Christ's humility and measure our position amongst men according to his measure, who gave up fellowship with God to become a man and suffer on a cross. Hugh Binning was a Puritan preacher uh, who died when he was only 26 years old, my age. Hugh Binning. And he has a book called Christian Love. Simply Christian Love. And we have it in our library here. It's one of the Puritan paperbacks. And I hope I'm not able to find it after this service because one of you has checked it out. But Binning says that humility makes a man compare himself with the best that he may find out how bad he himself is. But pride measures by the worst, that it may hide from a man his own imperfections and say, oh, I'm not that bad. Christ himself is the example of humility, of showing just how low he must humble himself, even death on a cross. Humility is a virtue which is at the heart of Christianity, and every Christian 
who has been truly convicted of their sin. Benning continues, Humility is the root of charity, and meekness is the fruit of both. There is no solid and pure ground of love to others unless the rubbish of self-love is first cast out of the soul. Only when this has happened can charity, love, service have a solid and a deep foundation. So let us cast off and fight against pride and self-love that we find in our hearts, both of which are held to be virtues by today's secular society. We are constantly being told that we must have pride in ourselves. Even in this upcoming month is June, isn't it? What happens every June? Pride Month, as they call it. I think appropriately. We are told constantly that we must have pride in ourselves, that we must love ourselves as we are. But this is not what Christ calls us to. He says, whoever wants to follow me and claim the name and the riches of Christ must be last of all. Our position must be that of John the Baptist, who said of Christ, he must increase, but I, I must decrease. And if this is to be true, we are to be last of all. And so we must be servants of all. Service and, and work in this sense is merely an outer reflection of the inner man. If we regard ourselves as least of all, or as Peter says, subject one to another and clothed with humility, we will have no problem, take no issue, have no grumblings about serving all others around us. Christ is the suffering servant. Are we willing to count ourselves with him in that suffering service. In John chapter 13, uh, when this same group, Jesus and the disciples, go into that upper room for the Last Supper, what does Jesus do? He washes the disciples' feet. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus is the first, the greatest man and teacher and Lord that ever lived. And he came not to be served, but to serve. And to serve the lowliest collection of sinners, ourselves, the church. As the hymn says, Humiliation he embraced, his father to obey. Serving men became his lot. The king became a slave. Becoming a man that men might live, that sinners he might save. Jesus calls us here explicitly to follow him as our example. To willingly serve without distinction, without notice. Willing that our service would even be forgotten in this world and amongst those that we serve but doing it all because we count ourselves servants of all. This means that we must serve those who are least of all, that the church and all of its people must go out of their way to serve the afflicted, the downtrodden, the helpless, the widow, the orphan. Will we serve the socially awkward, those who test our patience, or even the people we simply just don't like? Will we still serve them? In a word, we must serve those who have nothing to offer us, whether by praise and recognition or thanks or money or anything else. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. We serve and love not because we can get anything from it, but because he first loved us. 
Naturally, the leaders in the church are called to the highest standard here. The word here used for servant is uh, diakonos, deacon, as we would have it. And this is exactly what you men who are called to be deacons or are prayerfully considering becoming deacons are called to do. Serving all, counting all as greater than yourself. And as far as the minister, or men such as myself training for the ministry, uh, Count von Zinzendorf has a famous line, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. Are we willing to preach the gospel, to die, and to be forgotten like that? Likewise, Augustine speaks to office holders. A bishop's office, any office holder in the church, is a name of labor rather than honor. So he who covets preeminence rather than usefulness may understand that he's not a bishop at all. Altogether then, you officers of the church or those that are thinking of becoming officers in the near future, are you pursuing this because of hope for personal greatness and recognition for your service? Or are you truly doing it because you want to pour yourselves out in service to the least of all? That's what you're called to do. But all the more, this is for every Christian. All of you who serve every day. We see the service in you mothers who bear and raise covenant children in Christ's name. Now what a humbling service uh, this is, raising children. And it's precisely the kind of service that Jesus is thinking about here in this text. Because it is mundane. It is day to day. Often thankless, both from the world and from even your own children. Ryle says that the person who puts the most effort into serving other people and in being useful, just useful in this present time, is the greatest in the eyes of Christ. And also you caregivers who patiently wait on the needs of the elderly and the infirm. That you are who Christ has in mind here. Your patience and your, your humility day in and day out reflects Christ in all who you care for. You hardworking fathers, when the work is never done and the bills are never paid and the years seem to grind by, all of these, motherhood, care for those around us, working hard to put food on the table, bearing with the other weak members of the church, these are chores, yes, that are universal to all mankind. But what makes them different for a Christian is why we do them. Not for our own gain or survival, but for Christ's glory, counting ourselves as least of all and servants of all. And really, this is the sort of theology that a working family Needs Even doing these most normal activities out of love of God and a respect for his commands is a greater and more real form of Christian service than the thoughts of some ivory tower theologian locked away in his study. It's really only when the Holy Spirit works through such thankless and mundane service that God is best seen as a living God through the members of his church active even in the most grueling parts of life. All of you who have been worn out and worn down by your service to Christ, take heart. The Lord sees what you are doing and what you have done. And you are known and recognized by Him. Only check your own heart. Remind yourself again and again as you need to throughout this week that this service is for Christ's sake, not for an earthly reward. It's not for having a bigger house. It's not for having better behaved children or a long weekend to look forward to. We cannot count on such things. But we can count on Christ. So we work to be first of all in God's eyes and not in man's. And this is why Jesus uses the example of a child here in verses 36 and 37. Now, children at that time were not valued. Like we, as a Christian uh, inheritance, do value children today. There was, at that time, a far greater chance that children would die in infancy or early childhood. So why really put a value or care on them? It was not uncommon for parents to abandon children. And what we call child abuse wasn't even a category that they would have thought of. 
But here is Jesus, the great teacher and theologian in his teaching role as a rabbi to his preeminent dis disciples, right? And he is saying and proving it by himself that associating with the lowly, because the lowest of this time were children, this is the Christian's place and service. Who are the least of these today? Overlooked at best and abused at work. At worst, we can think of readily more than a few examples. The unborn who are tortured and killed in their mother's wombs. The disabled and poor who this culture says it is better that they kill themselves than they go on living. Our society has all sorts of what the Nazis called Lebens and Wertesleben, lives unworthy of life. Christ says, not only no, you are made in the image of God and are valued, but, he, but to those unwanted refuse of society, he receives them physically, he welcomes them, and he cares for them himself. Jesus takes a special place for caring for children all throughout his ministry. And we can see uh, that in the next chapter, right, where Christ says, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of heaven. And I hope, children, this is an encouragement and an, a comfort for you. This shows that Jesus loves children. He physically invites them in, and he, he takes them on his knee as a father would his own child. But his point here in receiving this child, in welcoming and receiving him without complaint, but with humble love, isn't just unique to his ministry. But it's what the rest of us Christians are called to do. And not only with children, but everyone that is considered lowly in some respect. This child is representative of all who are outcast by a sinful society whose culture has broken them. Our culture leaves behind boys who are addicted to porn and have no male role models, and so therefore they act accordingly. Our culture leaves behind women who have been told to maim their bodies and make themselves infertile. Our culture would kill the most innocent of lives in the womb. But Christians are to serve them all, the broken and the maimed, those abandoned by the culture that does not care for their souls. We are to count ourselves as less valuable than even those broken people in all of their imperfection. And we are to serve them all with a glad heart. A note here, and we cannot miss this because it qualifies everything that Jesus is saying. He says to do this service in my name. What does this mean? Well, it brings us back to Christ's purpose in the first place. Jesus isn't just commending any service that we would render to a lowly person. He demands that we bless the least amongst us by good works, by love, by mercy, yes, but all for his name's sake. For his and the Father's glory. We do this all in his name and for his cause, not, not to abstractly make a better world, as many liberal theologians and politicians would hope to do. No, we hope to conquer this world for Christ by doing all we do as a witness to Christ's name and glory. We can make this personal. Christ is not saying that, that someone is blessed who loves to spend time with kids or who volunteers at the library with the local homeless population. Those aren't bad things, but if they are not done in Christ's name and for his glory, they are done for the wrong reasons, really for sinful reasons. There are many people who volunteer their time to give back because it makes them feel good. But Jesus demands more than er earthly work for earthly reasons. And by doing our work truly for Christ's cause and not for our own, all of our service is a spiritual work, gives glory to Christ, and is counted by him as something greater than self-interest and self-service. Therefore, I, I want to finish out by focusing on the reward that Christ promises to those who take the lowest place and serve the lowly in his name. And this too is a matter of receiving 
Read again verse 37. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. We are called to welcome, to receive the lowliest among us, such as little children. And Jesus promises that if we do so, the lowly are not the only ones that we will be receiving. If we receive these lowly ones for Christ's sake, we will also receive him and the one who sent him, God the Father. And that's really an amazing statement on Jesus' part. This is not dealing with uh, the, the Father receiving us into salvation. The context here is one of people already being believers. Rather, it is the reward, the being first, that humble service to the least will bring to a Christian. Even as God sees all the work that we do and can spy out our sin, sure, so we can see the good service we do through the Holy Spirit. And he promises to reward us accordingly. Jesus, Jesus says, all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What God promises to us, if we take up our cross and humbly serve the lowly, is so much better than self-aggrandizement or, or trying to make ourselves first amongst men. It is exaltation with Christ, being raised up with Him and receiving a crown of glory. And if you count yourself as last of all and willing to serve the lowest of all, you can know in your conscience that you are serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you are receiving Him. There is a glory of association with God himself here. Not with man in his, what, greatness? But with God in his greatness. And so you can rightly say that even in tending a child, you are tending to God's interests. As you did to the least of these, you did also to me. Paul, in his uh, letter to the Colossians, as he encourages the Colossians, puts this in really a short snapshot. He says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ by receiving, by welcoming others, even the lowest and most hurting people of this world. We lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven and we lay hold of the inheritance that is ours in Christ Jesus. All of you, who work heartily and serve humbly in Christ's name, will receive this great inheritance with Christ in greater honor and glory through his service. Let us seek these greater rewards that come from God rather than any reward that comes from man. Thank God that we do have such reward to look forward to. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we are humbled that you would even come down to serve us. You who are greatest of all, who made your own son to be like us in our failures in the flesh. Only he lived a sinless life and we can receive the glories that he has won by his death on the cross by serving as he would have us serve. Lord, I pray that part of our service would be going out of our way to reach to others in our own families, in our own lives, that we would seek to serve our time, our energy, and even our money. So I pray that you would bless the, the giving that we now give. In Christ's name we pray.